five. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much and welcome to this virtual major developments panel meeting. Can I remind all the attendees to turn their mobile phones to silent, please? And uh, and lock the dog out or something so that we don't get disturbed. Um, I just to read out the uh, the protocol for virtual meetings. Members are to ensure that they have their videos on at all times and microphones on mute unless speaking. In the case of a technical problem, the meeting may adjourn until the issue is resolved. If the technical problem persists and the meeting is in quora, the meeting will be abandoned and rearranged for a later date. And I'd remind everybody the meeting is being audio and video recorded and will be available on the council website to view within the next few days. Um, I'd like also to ask all the people that are making presentations if they can to limit them to about 15 minutes, which will mean that we will have about 15 minutes discussion. I don't, I don't want us to go on more than about two hours. And uh, it is my intention that after the first two presentations that we have a, a five minute break to uh, walk around, make a cup of tea and whatever. Um, because I know that two hours staring at a screen is, is a bit too much. Um, so the first presentation will be just now and that that's the presentation from Pocket Living. The second presentation round about half past six will be the North London Collegiate School. Um, so Premier House will be there or thereabouts at seven o'clock and Vaughan Road Car Park will be about 7.30. That's, that's probably the earliest that we can manage to get round. Uh, first of all, can I just check who we've got with me? I'm Keith Ferry, I'm the chair. Uh, I think we've got Councillor Ali. Yes, I'm here on telephone. And Councillor Palmer. Well, I can see Councillor Palmer on there. So, um, and uh, I believe that we've got a reserve member. Yes, yes, Chair. <clears throat> Councillor Simon Brown reserving for um, David Perry. And um, Councillor Ashton, I can see. Yes, Councillor Ros yeah. And Councillor Osborne. Yeah, I'm here. And Councillor Greek. Uh, yes, good evening, Chairman. Could could I ask the officers that are present to introduce themselves? Uh, yes, Chair, I'm Beverly Kishaw, our Chief Planning Officer. I will ask each of the officers now to introduce themselves in turn. Good evening, members. My name is Orla Murphy. I'm the Head of Development Management in the Planning Department. Good evening, members. Katie Parkins, uh, Principal Planning Officer for the West Team. Good evening, members. Uh, Nicola Rankin, Planning Case Officer for North London Collegiate School and Premier House. OK, is that it? Right, um, the declarations of interest have been done in a slightly different way in that we've been all asked to declare our interests and that has been put on to the council website. Item three is to approve and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of February this year. Uh, is everybody content that I can approve and sign those minutes? I don't hear anybody dissenting, therefore move on to item four. Um, as this is a new municipal year, we have to deal with the appointment of vice chair of the panel. Now, as you know, we try and keep politics well out of this business uh, as much as we can. That is, it doesn't stop us having a few jibes at each other, but um, the normal process has been that the vice chair comes from the conservative members. So um, can I have a nomination for vice chair? Yeah, um, can I nominate Councillor Marilyn Ashton, please? OK, yeah. Is there a seconder for that? Uh, I'll second that, Chairman. OK, I think that's the only nomination. Therefore, Mara Ashton is the vice chair for the next year. Uh, public questions, none have been received. Um, item six petitions. Sorry. OK, uh, I don't know if there's been any petitions. I haven't heard of any. 
um, and there have been no requests for deputations. I have had a request for uh, a backbencher on item 11, Vaughan Road Car Park, Councillor Karima Marikar has indicated she wishes to speak. Are, are we in agreement with that? Yes, good. OK, then I'm not waiting on that because I have a pecuniary interest in item 11. You're muted, Keith. Right. Which bit didn't you hear? I've in, I've invited the um, the representatives for Pocket Living to present their um, presentation, and that's Matt Driscoll, the architect, and Joseph Arthur, the applicant. Yes, I'm here, Chair. It's it's Joe Arthur from Pocket Living, and um, Matt Matt is going to share his screen with the presentation. Wonderful. Okay. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for your time tonight. Um, my name is Joe Arthur, and I'm uh, a development manager for for this site at Pocket Living. I'll talk to you more about Pocket a bit later on, but um, we're a, we're an affordable housing developer funded by the Mayor of London. Now this application is on Sheepcote Road, which is just outside the town centre, and some of you may may know it as the current Halford store. And we're delighted to bring forward our first application uh, in the borough of Harrow. Over the past ten months, we've held seven pre-apps with officers and also a design review panel. And over that time, we've worked with officers to develop a scheme for 149 100% intermediate affordable homes that will all be sold at a 20% discount to local prices and the homes will be available to local first time buyers. As I said earlier tonight, I'm joined by Matt Driscoll from Threefold Architects and he'll be able to run you through the, the details of our proposals. And there are also some some of my colleagues that are on hand for any questions that you might have. And um, I'll now hand over to Matt. Thank you, Joe. Um, good evening, members, officers and all other interested parties joining us in this virtual space. Um, I'm a founding director of Threefold Architects and have been leading uh, my team on this project since we first became involved with it. Um, our practice is currently working across five London boroughs on a range of projects for both private and local authority clients to deliver high quality, sustainable, affordable, shared ownership and private tenure homes. And I'm delighted also to be a part of this highly professional team seeking to bring the first pocket living homes to Harrow. So as Joe said, I'm going to talk you through the site and the evolution of the current design proposal. The site is situated just south of the junction between Station Road and Sheepcote Road um, to the northeast of the town centre opposite the emerging Harrow One development. It's located on the edge of the town centre and within the Harrow and Wheelstone Opportunity and Intensification area. It's served by excellent transport links with three underground rail and uh, multiple bus routes uh, within a short walking distance and consequently it's rated with a PTAL 6A. It's currently occupied by a large retail shared and associated car park, a combination of land uses which are increasingly unsustainable and inappropriate in a town centre location such as this, particularly where there is a need for high quality affordable homes. This aerial diagram looking from the west um, shows the site outlined in red and its relationship with the context. Uh, the surroundings to the east and south are predominantly residential. Uh, the nearest buildings are three and four storey apartment blocks of Manor Court and Kensington Heights. And this type of development flanks both sides of Sheepcote Road as it rises up the hill, a pattern which is reinforced by the Harrow One scheme currently under construction opposite the site, which runs to between eight and 16 storeys in height. The northern edge of our site is bounded by the blank flank wall 
um, of the Grade 2 listed Gold's Gym, formerly the Granada Cinema. And along the western edge are the gardens uh, and rear elevation of Manor Parade, a three-storey interwar shopping parade with commercial high street use, uh, ground floor and residential upper floors. The area within our site boundary, which is available for development, amounts to uh, 0.21 hectares. So it's a small and complex site with a number of constraints which have an impact on the development potential. Um, the building footprint is defined by appropriate separation between the proposed building and neighbouring homes. Um, there are a number of existing parking bays uh, used by the residents of Manor Parade on site, which are to be maintained along with the vehicular access to and from these bays and the associated manoeuvring space. The green arrow on this diagram illustrates an existing right of way across the site enjoyed by the residents of Manor Court, which is to be maintained. This will align directly with the pedestrian route between the Harrow One development and the St John's the Baptist Church, linking through to the town centre. This site presents a real opportunity to replace this unsightly store with a high quality development, which will activate the street scene and enhance the public realm at the street frontage and the groundscape within the development. This sketch shows the proposed massing highlighted here in yellow. It's a broken L shape of two connected elements stepped in form in response directly to the established pattern of development within the immediate and wider context. The building responds to the height and form of the adjacent Gold's Gym and Manor Court at the rear, gradually stepping up as it wraps around the site towards Sheepcut Road, where the proposed nine storey principal element addresses the Harrow One development opposite. And that stepped pattern continues within the wider townscape, as you can see on this diagram, with buildings increasing in height towards the town centre. The form and scale of the proposed development has been developed in relate, uh, to relate appropriately to the surrounding context. So the proposed car-free development seeks to create 149 one-bedroom intermediate affordable homes for Harrow's first-time buyers. It will replace an incongruous retail shed with a high quality building, enhancing the street scene and public realm, and will include a variety of communal amenity spaces for the residents, secure cycle storage, and on-site wheelchair accessible parking. It's been our goal throughout to design a contemporary building, which is both referential of and therefore harmonious with its context. In our research of the area and its history, we're particularly interested in the interwar shopping parades, which were a consistent feature of this part of northwest London as the metro land developed. And this slide shows some of our own studies of a few local examples. These buildings often echoed historic architectural styles from Georgian to Art Deco, and a common thread in all of them is the articulation of the ground floor at street level in a contrasting material, defining its separate function. And on the upper floors, the use of relief and varied tones of patterns and brickwork articulate detail and variety in the facade, which contribute to the character of the area. In response to this, we've developed an architectural vocabulary which borrows from and reflects the character of these features of the high streets. Elemental parts of the facade are expressed in different tones and patterns of brickwork. A primary light grey brickwork on the profile of vertical column elements is contrasted with a soft red brick woven horizontally across the facade, expressing the floor edges and window heads. Horizontal masonry elements at two storey intervals create breaks in the facade. And together with the detail in the metalwork balconies and window frames, these elements combine to create a rhythm to the facade articulated with relief, tone and texture. A key part of the design has been to create active corners which frame and announce the entrances of the two buildings. So the double height main entrance depicted here on Sheepcut Road has a glazed facade which wraps the corner of the building, activating this prominent corner visible from Station Road. The glazing is set back and sheltered by a colonnade which frames that entrance and creates a threshold between the building and the public realm. The use of red brick exclusively across the ground floor, ground and first floors here on this principal element articulate a podium emphasising the entrance and grounding the building. A similar approach is applied to the entrance of the north building, similarly, which you can see on the key plan. Similarly, on the forward corner, it's set back beneath a single storey colonnade and that glazing to the entrance wraps around the front and side, activating the pedestrian route to Manor Court between the buildings. This visualisation 
shows the view of the proposed development from Sheepcoat Road. And you can see here the relationship between the two entrances, how they activate each corner and animate the public realm at a pedestrian level. That pedestrian route through the site is emphasised by the gap between the buildings, which draws the eye through. Lightweight bridge decks provide access between the two buildings at the upper level. And at intermediate levels, these are widened to create shared balcony spaces. This ground level plan illustrates the layout on the site. The main entrance to the building and lobby occupy that prominent corner of the building facing down Sheepcut Road and activating the street frontage with an enhanced public realm to the front of the building, replacing the existing low planter there and creating a much wider area of pavement. The existing vehicular junction, shown in red, uh, is retained to provide access to and from the maintained parking spaces within the site and to the five on-site wheelchair accessible parking bays. The green arrow illustrates that retained pedestrian route through the site and between the two buildings. And the proposal provides guest cycle storage as part of the public realm and landscaping, which is designed as a shared surface to create a high quality pedestrian and cycle friendly environment around the buildings. The pocket living home has evolved over a number of years and that design has been tweaked and refined in close collaboration with the residents. And as you can see from the photos, they are high quality contemporary homes with generous floor to ceiling glazing, which ensures they're light and bright throughout. A simple palette of high quality, robust materials, finishes and fittings are carefully chosen to ensure long life and low maintenance. Designed to be single aspects, the tall glazing and internal layout ensures excellent light penetration throughout. Central to Pocket Living's ethos is the provision of high quality shared amenity spaces for their residents. Spaces to spark encounter, encourage social interaction and foster a sense of community. This development is no different and the design provides for a range of these spaces throughout. The ground floor has two communal gardens shown on this slide at the rear of the site, a kitchen garden at the top for residents to grow produce and these have proven pre extremely popular on other developments and a separate quiet reflective space. The ground floor homes all have private external terraces or small gardens and the remainder of the site's ground floor is landscaped to create a shared surface public realm. There are two roof terraces on the upper floors, a fifth floor on the north building and an eighth floor on the south building. And these provide generous external spaces for relaxing alone or socialising with other residents. And Pocket have a track record of providing high quality shared spaces throughout their developments, which are extremely popular. Across this proposal, we've created a wide range of spaces to suit personality and preference, which are well distributed for ease of access. They're never far from anyone's front door and the total provision here will exceed the policy requirements. I'm now going to hand you back to Joe, who will talk a bit more about the need for and the availability of these homes for the people of Harrow. Thank you, Matt and, um, and councillors. Um, as Matt's just said, I'd like to finish briefly just, just talking about Pocket um, for those of you who may not be so familiar. Uh, so we're, we're a small developer and we we're established in 2005 to deliver affordable homes across London for, for those on moderate incomes. Now they're the, the squeeze middle, uh, the people who, who cannot afford to buy a home on the open market. Um, but uh, earn too much for for um, social housing. And the importance of what Pocket does is recognised uh, in partnerships with um, both the GLA and Homes England, who, who both um, help fund our developments. And we're now working with 20 boroughs across London, and we're thrilled uh, to come to Harrow for, for, for the first time. As I mentioned earlier, Pocket homes are sold at a 20% discount to local prices. And to be eligible, purchases must be first time buyers who live or work in the borough, and they must earn less than the, than the mayor's income threshold. And this enables purchasers to, to buy uh, and stay in their community. And there are covenants in the lease that ensure that those homes, they remain affordable in, in perpetuity. And exactly that, ensuring that homes are affordable to local time, uh, local first time buyers um, is, is at the heart of what Pocket does. Um, so the proposed homes uh, here would be affordable to 42,000 people in the borough 
and, it, and, and within that number, 18,000 of those would be would be key workers. Now we know that pocket homes are more affordable than private private sale, shared ownership, um, and and private rent. And um, we're delighted to say that 40% um, of pocket buyers are, are key workers, and that is double the London average. And over numerous years, this has helped. This has helped people, um, as you can see on your screen there, such as Nathan, um, the teacher, and, and Tara, the, uh, the nurse. So finally, um, I'd just like to run you through the indicative um, timescales. So later this month, uh, we'll be submitting our planning application. And then we'd like to come back, uh, come back and see you at uh, committee by, by the end of this year. And if approval is granted, then we're able to start on site in, in spring next year. And we've got a track record of building quickly. And that will enable 149 first time buyers to, to move into their new homes in summer 2023. So thank you very much for your time this evening. I um, appreciate it's been a fairly compact presentation. Um, and uh, myself and the team would be very happy to take any questions that, that, that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's almost exactly 15 minutes and thank you for that. And a very, uh, very detailed and um, interesting presentation it was. Are there any questions from members of the panel? Stephen. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, very, very interesting um, proposal. Um, just wanted to ask, um, obviously, you, you said that the homes would be reserved for residents and key workers. How would, for these purposes, how are you defining a resident and a key worker? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the on the eligibility criteria, um, only people who live or work within the borough of Harrow are eligible to buy these homes. And, and on, the, on, on your point about um, key workers, uh, um, historically, um, Pocket has provided a lot of a lot of homes to key workers um, who, who, who fit that demographic demographic. So they're young people. Um, who, who are either living or they're working within within the borough. Um, so do they have to have lived, presumably they have to have lived and worked in the borough for a specific number of years or? Um, it's it's ba based on a, on a priority scale. So those who, who perhaps have lived or uh, lived in the borough for a longer amount of time would be would be of a higher priority for the for these homes um, because essentially we want these homes to go to, to local people so they can stay in the community. OK, and um, do, would the owner then, if they're buying it to the, at 80 percent of, of market value, would they then own the whole property or would there be a, a shared ownership arrangement or would they only own the leasehold? Or? Yeah, so they, they own they own the property outright. Um, and when they come to sell that property in, in a few years time, they sell to um, an eligible person uh, like themselves when, when they when they bought at the, uh, at the point of sale. So it, it, it keeps the, the homes um, affordable and, and also um, to, to local people. And would they then have to sell on at 80 percent market value? So the, the, at that point, the uh, they would instruct um, an RICS accredited uh, valuer and they would um, they would take uh, the, the the provisions within the lease which restrict uh, the sale to only people live or work in the borough who earn within the mayor's income threshold and are first time buyers and there is and that, that's that's the way that the homes are uh, are kept affordable in perpetuity. So they have so they have to so they have to sell at that at, at the on the same terms at which they bought it, basically. Correct. Correct. Um, so, so if so, if somebody is then, um, you know, if they're selling and they're only getting back a market value, does that does that then um, does that then hinder them if they then want to move up and move up the housing ladder? No, it, it, it's 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 the restriction that keeps them affordable. So that person would sell. Um, at the restricted at, at, the, at the reduced price um, because because what's what's contained within the lease and then um, they could then move move upwards the, the housing ladder 
um, via the, the equity that they've gained in that property over, over a period of time. Right. OK. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Mar OK, Marilyn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a PTEL score of 6A is high. And I note that you said that the development was car free. Um, but that doesn't actually mean you can stop people having a car. It just means they'll have nowhere to park it. Um, and we've had this with other developments that have yet to have planning permission, some proposals that we've been looking at. Um, how do you go about um, when you do come to sell this to people, uh, trying to discourage them from car ownership? And, and, you know, is there any kind of way you can do that? Because I can't yeah. think of one offhand. OK, I, th I think the first the, the first point to say is overwhelmingly uh, uh, pocket buyers don't have cars. They, uh, to put it plumb, they they don't they don't they can't afford a car. Uh, they don't they tend to have cars. They don't they tend to need cars. Now, um, onto onto your second point, um, it's with, within the within their lease and within the section one hundred six. Um, it, it w that will mean that they're unable to obtain uh, a parking permit, and we know yeah. that, lo that locally. Uh, around this site that there are CPZs which would which would not en enable them to park their car on neighboring streets so that they're, they're they're actively discouraged to have a car many many of them use public transport and and also uh, bicycles as well um, lo lots of people cycle lots of our bike lots of our pocket residents cycle yeah. so um just just to clarify um you're saying they can't afford a car, and I, I dare say a lot, a lot can't. But how do you actually means test people in, in the context of? Obviously, you know that they're going to live in Harrow or work in Harrow, and obviously you want it that they're key workers and they have to satisfy that requirement. But how do you know that they may well be that and they want to buy something that's quite a good deal because they do it actually, and they mm. qualify. But how do you know that they don't have any other form of income that wouldn't necessarily be the sort of thing that you uh, like bank mum and dad? You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, I understand. Um, it's just that I'm not quite sure how you assess this. So um, in order to be eligible, they need to register first with um, they, they register with Share to Buy, which is a which is a government scheme. And also they would register with Pocket. Um, I think at the moment in Harrow, we've got something like 140 people who are registered and, and, that, and that database is growing um but it, but it's thoroughly checked by we have we have an in-house sales team at pocket and um who are all very experienced with these types of buyers and their their income levels um their savings they're all um they're all uh, reviewed and and also provided advice uh for mortgages for example so it's all quite rigorously checked um when when they register okay i'm not quite sure about that but thank you for the answer thank you okay yes. is there anybody else that's got any questions no i don't see anybody so um thank you very much uh matt and joseph um very interesting and we look forward to seeing it at the planning committee in in six months or so time thank you for your presentation. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So we move on to the presentation on the North London Collegiate School and I believe we've got Sarah Clark, who's the applicant and Michael Cohen, who's the architect. Uh, thank you very much, Councillors. Good evening. Thank you for your time. I'm excited to present this next chapter in the North London Collegiate School's history, one that we help we hope will help secure the long term sustainability of the school, as well as affording us the opportunity to welcome many more children and adults from the local area onto our school site, thereby reinforcing our commitment to the local community. 
North London has a proud history of academic endeavour, scholarship and service to the community. And we have for generations been teaching girls and young women to embrace their joy in learning and to encourage them to take active, useful and leading roles in our society. We want to raise the profile of science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics, STEAM subjects among girls, not just those in our school community. There is ample evidence that women are not represented as much as they should be, particularly in leading roles within the science, technology, engineering and mathematical sectors. And also there's overwhelming evidence that they should be. Diversity in thinking is the key to finding inspirational and dynamic solutions to the key problems facing society today. Climate change, inequality between countries and citizens, the need to manage and cultivate more resources to address sustainable development and a huge number of other truly global challenges are all in desperate need of innovative and clever solutions. And the best way to find them is to encourage divergent thinking, to embrace creative and exhilarating solutions, to dare to bring new ways of thinking to a traditionally linear system of thought. We need more women to bring creativity and flair to such issues. We need more women to embrace the opportunities that careers in those areas will provide. We need more women in STEAM. To this aim, we have been working very hard and in a very constructive way with Harrow Council over the past four years to develop a master plan for our school's site development. We hope that these proposed new buildings that we're shortly going to be able to talk to you about will enable us to welcome even more local children and people into the school to gain the benefits of our resources, our programmes of study and our partnership activities. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our architects who are going to take you through those proposals in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Hi, I'm Michelle Cohen. Can you see my screen? Sorry, I called you Michael, I think. Please don't worry. Honestly, perverse parents. <laughs> um, can, is, is, is the presentation up? Yeah. Yes, it is. Brilliant. I'm going to rush through this and I'm sorry, we've got so much to talk about, but um, hopefully there'll be questions and lots of them afterwards. So as Sarah said, we have been working um, with the school Oh, goodness, it's not going. Oops, there we are. Since 2016, we've had some brilliant pre-act um, with, with the um, local authority. We've also seen um, the GLA twice and got their support. And we had a very good DRP um, review earlier this year. The reason for um, doing this is really to try and agree with the school and with Harrow um, what the aims, first of all, the, are of the master plan and what the first buildings are, because this is going to be a hybrid master plan and I'll show you how it, it works and why um, as we go through the presentation. There are a couple of key things that the school need to do. Um, we need to create a really new welcome entrance. We've got to sort out the safeguarding at the school. It's a very porous site at the moment. We've got to, as Sarah said, create learning spaces that are fit for the 21st century and actually beyond. And we've, we've somehow got to improve the coherence and accessibility around the buildings and the spaces um, on, on the site, which is very much a campus in a very unique um, setting, which is very sensitive from a planning point of view. So since 2016, we have been analysing the site. We've looked at the historic context. We know that there are listed buildings on the site. There are listed terraces. Um, it's in a conservation area. We've looked at the development of the heights of the buildings um, over the years and how those have been developed and the topologies. Um, and what we've tried to do with this master plan and then the phase one development is align the school's physical um, estate with their educational vision, which is slightly different and moving forward um, in a STEAM blended way, as, as Sarah has noted. We really have had to identify the, the constraints and opportunities on the site. And as I've explained, there are many. Um, we, the school has worked very closely with us to um, develop a, a strong case for um, development in very special circumstances because it is in an MOL. Um, and 
I've spoken about the engaging with with all of the users and no more so um, your your local um, planning offices. So I just want to orientate you a little bit. Delkey Grove runs along here. Cannons Drive comes up over here. They, they are the important views to the Mansion House, which is located over here. And when we speak about the Loop Road, this is off Delkeith Grove in this area. And we know that 80% or well, no, actually 70% of the students arrive by coach and minibus, which the school um, runs um, to get to the pupils to school. Um, and they arrive from the Loop Road. Um, at the moment, there's no there's no safeguarding um, from this area and and pupils can just bleed in um, to the site. In fact, anyone can. The key buildings in the master plan, and I'll just go through them quickly. Building A is a very small extension to what we call the tractor barn, which will be um, facilities management. Building B, the ideas hub, and we'll speak a lot more about this um, through the presentation. C is about a new entrance um, for the school um, and administration, and it's non-academic administration. D is the consolidation of the junior school, which currently is a single story building and um, can, can really be built up in mass along the, the northern boundary. E, some new tennis courts in the very open part of the site, which is open and recognised as open and important for the MOL. F is um, music and PAC and drama linked to, I should say, the existing PAC, so a new building on an existing site. And likewise, H is a new building on an existing site, which is about extending the Richardson building and the um, academic um, accommodation should the school need it in years to come. So the master plan as you see it is the buildings, these are the buildings in red. Um, I've gone through each and every one of them and I've pointed them out to you. Phase one, which I'll show you now, deals with largely the buildings in this area and this will come forward not as an outline application but a full plans application and I'm going to move into describing um, those buildings now um, and I could just can I just say that we've worked really closely with the your your planning officers about the bulk and the density and their recommendation that any height actually is added uh, to the northern part of the site away from the sensitive listed building and listed terraces in this area. So We've thought quite a lot about um, phasing and um, I'm going to deal with phase one, which is everything you see in light blue over here um, in more detail. But phases two are the, the sports and the internal, so that the kind of extension to the sports hall and the extension to the music and drama building. And phase three is the junior school consolidation and the extension of the Richardson building um, in this location. You can see C is the um, entrance and um, non-academic administration. So that's very clear off the loop road, creating a new welcome entrance to the school. So as we worked through the design proposals, we um, became aware um, of the uh, requirement to try and link in to many of the school buildings on the site. Um, and in no particular order, um, the tractor barn extension sits next to the little tractor barn in this area over here along the loop road. Um, the, this is what we call the maintenance barn. It's this little building over here. The art building, which actually was built after the Richardson building. So this is a more contemporary building, but it's very well loved. The CDT buildings um, are these, although there's very little fabric left from the historic um, context, the, the footprint is very similar. And then the, the plant and our new building for admin and the ideas hub slide into and connect into these existing buildings for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, we need to ensure that we've got easy access to the facilities because at the moment you go in and out of buildings and there's some very unfortunate 
leftover spaces. We really want to preserve the history of the school and some of these old buildings are very much part of the history. So we're giving life to old buildings, securing um, their future and of course being able to deliver this um, blended curriculum that Sarah spoke about. So in terms of um, bulk amassing, what you can see in this image over here, the dotted red lines are the, the two new buildings in phase one. This is the mansion house over there, the pond, which is really important, the kind of heart of the school where everything kind of clusters around. And you can see the new building that we've proposed slides between many of the existing buildings and it actually provides cohesion to a part of the site that has been very eroded since 1866. Um, and it also provides the transition in height between the two story buildings in this area um, and the four story building, which is the latest extension to the teaching building, which was I think completed about eight or nine years ago. So you can see that in section with a little section at the bottom. We've made sure that we don't go higher than the art building over there, but there is a transition up to four stories and um, the existing buildings. Very quickly, the way the buildings work and I'll, they're colour coordinated. So the loop road is over here. We've got a new forecourt with the new security line in this area, allowing the sports hall to be used out of school hours without people coming into the main part of the school. Green is the new double volume um, entrance for the whole of the school. This is going to be the new reception space. Um, the, the purple bits are the non academic administration. The pink areas are the breakout spaces and I'll speak more about that um, as we, we go through um, the, the presentation because they link very closely to the, a, a dedicated community facility, which is the focal um, point for activity, community activities. Everything yellow is is art and what's really important is we are able to give the, the existing barn the, um, a new lease of life by creating a new sixth form art space because sixth form do go and, and work in these spaces for long periods of time um, and that is now created within the existing barn. On the ground floor we have engineering in blue and on the first floor the um, design studios which link very carefully to the art buildings. So the images that we're showing are not necessarily the images um, of the new building. These are being developed obviously, but the new entrance is double volume. It actually has a very strong visual link between the loop road and the pond. So you see right the way through and that was very important to us. And um, it will be a place where the school will be able to celebrate the work of the students very visibly. We move into the art buildings and I've spoken about they will stay in the Richardson uh, in, in the art building, which was which was designed by Richardson um, and they will also get a series of smaller spaces um, within the new proposals. The central breakout space is very different to um, spaces that you would find in in many schools. So this is because it's about collaboration. It's about independent learning. It's about group work, it's about um, prototyping, and it's also about being able to use the space in a way which encourages different ways of thinking. Um, so it sits right next to you and is, will also be used by very care, clearly by the community. It's got, a, it's, got its own facilities um, so that you can actually use these out of hours very easily without actually accessing the remainder of the school. Um, and the community hub space, which I've already pointed out over here, obviously it is dedicated, but you know the, the remainder of the building can also be used out of hours um, or in holidays by the community, um, whereas this can be used during the day. And it is really to encourage the things that Sarah was talking about, the STEAM, engineering, technology, promoting this cross-curricular and cross-departmental working it's about creative thinking in its, in its widest sense. And that's what we, this building is all about, a blending of some of the more um, traditional vertical departments that, that you find in schools. 
engineering and technology. So for the first time, we will have a proper woodwork, a proper metalwork, and we have um, a hot works um, workshop as well, which the school doesn't have at the moment, and they really do need it to explore these um, technologies and engineering fully. The design studios are where um, engineering and, and design overlap with art, and that's why they are located on the first floor. They are slightly cleaner spaces, and they are supported by a 3D printing um, lab in, 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 on that floor, so that for the first time, the school will really be able to explore things like architecture, CAD, CAM, um, and, and, and things which they will be beginning to look at for careers moving forward. So I just wanted to finish off the presentation with the materiality of the building. Um, we did, we've done a lot of work on this um, with, uh, and, and, to, and took it to the DRP and worked very closely with your councillors. The, the building, the current buildings on the site, there are a lot of brick buildings, but there's also the old mansion house, which is stone and a buff colour. And so the materiality of this building brings together the brick of the buildings that surround, many of the buildings that surround the pond. And this is a view from, from looking across the pond. So the PAC is just to my right. Um, but the brickwork, will you will see the brickwork and we want to bag it with a, a render so that we get the color of the mansion building, but you see the texture of the brickwork. Um, it's important to us that the roof is a similar color um, that where we need a lot of transparency, for instance, in this area over here, which is into that amazing collaborative breakout um, ideas hub, that that is very transparent and open to the rest of the school. And around the entrance, which is this bit over here, we have picked up a timber um, canopy, which harks back to the timber on the PAC on the building right next to me, although you can't see it. Um, and that um, wraps around and gives the entrance um, a, a, a more of a, um, a, a public feeling um, so that it's very clear where the entrance is. This view is actually from the staff car park to the rear. Um, I, very few people will probably see this because the entrance to the loop road is on that side of the maintenance barn of this building over here. But I think what is really important and what you begin to see here are the use of PVs, but also the school has an incredible ambition to be um, to reduce their carbon emissions. So we are using PVs um, and air source heat pumps for this building as their heat source completely. And we are looking at what, how we can um, tie that into the remainder of the master plan. Um, and finally, from my side is the um, what you will see from the loop road, how we will very carefully link to the existing building. So there's a glazed link between the, the, um, uh, the, the barn and our new building. The very glazed entrance over there, so you see right the way through the reception to the pond. And then this is actually an open area that will be gated when um, it's not in school use. So the pupils will finally have a, a way to celebrate their way um, into the school. And I'm going to hand over to Jill. I hope that Jill can. Um, yeah, I'm to here, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jill Eaton from ICNE Projects. We're planning consultants and I'm conscious of time, so I'll just quickly mention a couple of headline points on the planning um, aspects. So we've, we've given full and detailed regard um, to the MOL whilst balancing all the other constraints, such as the conservation area and listed building considerations. The buildings are all sited within the existing building clusters and take account of the important views. There is minimal increase in the built footprint and the function and purpose of the MOL has been considered from the outset to ensure that all regard is given to these considerations. And finally, a detailed, very special circumstances case has been set out and we will be um, submitting this with the application. This sets out in full the need case and the extensive community access to the educational facilities which will be delivered as part of the scheme. Thank you. Back to you, Michelle. Mm. Thanks, Jill. I think that's it from us. I mean, we hope to make the application um, imminently. We've been desperate to do so, actually, and I think we've got to the stage where everything's ready to go. Um, and thank you very much for your time.
And over to you. Do you, do you want me to stop sharing this? I don't know if you can leave that there. Are there any questions? Um, I've, I've just got a couple. Is, is there any increase in student numbers uh, envisaged when, when um, these buildings are completed? No, there's no increase in student numbers. We'll be keeping it exactly the same. Is there anything else, Michelle, on that point you want to add? No, I was just going to say we the student numbers are sitting at about 1,100. There is actually an approval, an approved maximum of 1,250. And that's the intention is that we certainly wouldn't be increasing um, beyond that. And the school has no ambition to do to increase. Uh, and, and the second question is, you said you're putting a planning application in. Is that just for phase one or would it include the whole master plan? No, so we're putting in a hybrid master plan. Um, so it is phase one in full and the remainder as the master plan in outline. So all of the other phases um, will be come forward as, a, forward as an outline master plan. Sorry, I jumped in there. <laughs> Sorry, that's, right. that's fine. The uh, the access, I think the access will be in full for the outline and all of the matters reserved um, for later consideration. Good. Stephen, got your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I noticed um, you mentioned special, very special circumstances, um, which suggests that, that that something is, you know, technically being being breached, um, potentially in terms of the MOL. Um, I'm just wondering what 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 is what is it that's being breached and that needs the, the very special circumstances? Yeah, there's very marginal increase in the footprint. So we've worked extremely hard to keep the design very much on the previously developed land and the hard standing areas. And because there's a very marginal increase, then we've got a very detailed um, and well articulated educational need angle and um, the community use that's been derived from the project. So it's to address that very marginal increase that's looking to be in the region of about 3% over the existing building footprint. We're just finalising that figure, but it's in that sort of um, quantum. Thank you. Is that 3% is, is, is that of the total footprint of all the buildings on the site, or is that 3% of the, of the surrounding buildings? Uh, all the buildings on the site. So, Michelle, if you've got any more technical detail on exact figures, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, they, we we are finalising them and just checking them again. Um, it's three percent of the total buildings on the site, and it's about five percent of the over the different three phases. So, um, excluding the buildings that we're not touching. So, it would be, you know, ex excluding all of the pink, excluding that, you know, this building over mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So it's so it's, so it's a five percent overall increase in footprint. No, it's no, it's three percent overall, okay, five percent okay. over the three phases. So if you take out the buildings that we're not doing anything to, it's only the three phases that we that we showed you. That's okay. the five percent. So it's so it's so it's three percent of the um of of the total footprints of the site. Yeah. And five percent of the areas of the, of the footprint of the areas that you're working with. Exactly. Right, okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. That, thank you very much. That, that's very okay. clear. Thank you. Okay, Samfa, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a question. How are you going to deal with the disruption uh, during the construction work? It looks like there's going to be quite a bit of demolition and uh, the work going on and uh, there might be a bit of disruption uh, for the students. The Michelle, can you cover that, please? I, I can, and I'm sure Michael, if he's around, will probably want to add to this. Um, we have we're working very closely with the school about where um, the site compounds go. Obviously, they would, you know, we we these are in board of of the, you know we're looking at at using the staff car park. We're looking at using. And um, various areas, we've got three different areas that we can look at for temporary accommodation for students and also for um, the the works, you know, the, the um, site compound um, for for the school. Now, the school 
had, you know, when they when they built this building over here, they they dealt with with that very carefully, and the school will will no doubt make sure that that the primary thing is that we don't cause nuisance to our neighbours and that we have a very safe way into the school. Um, Michael, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I, mean, I think that, that, that really covers it. I mean, we're very mindful that we, we have a job to do, which is to, to educate our students. And so that takes priority. And we have to sort of work around that. That doesn't mean to say that there won't be some disruption, but we have to minimise it and we have to manage it and, and make sure that we, uh, we provide alternative accommodation, temporary accommodation for uh, students who might be displaced, for example, the art school in, in the time that we'd be building phase one um and uh, make make proper provision for them so the, their education is not compromised in any way thank you thank you very much for that are thank there you. any other questions no i don't see anybody indicating well thank you very much that was that was very interesting and um, we look forward to the planning application coming forward in the near future thank you very much uh, thank you for your time thank you, thank you time. very very much as I suggested, I think if we just take a break until about five past seven so that people can um, get their eyes working again and perhaps walk about, make a cup of tea. Stay logged in though.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, Julian Sutton here speaking on behalf of uh, Kedis uh, UK 13 uh, Limited. If I just share my screen. Can you all see that? Not at the moment. Yes, we can now. Yep. Fine. Thank you. Um, so, uh, members, this uh, this is a uh, built to rent scheme uh, comprising 43 units uh, to include an affordable element. Uh, that is to be achieved through the change of use of existing floor space and the creation of three additional floors on the building. In addition, the application proposes new uh, workspace as well as other various uh, associated works. And this application in combination with the residential development under uh, permitted development rights of the existing office floor space on the site will give a total uh, combined scheme of 116 units uh, on the site. Before I just talk about the application site in more detail, uh, just a few words about Achilles um, for anyone who is not aware. Uh, Achilles is one of Sweden's largest real estate companies. Um, it owns and manages residential property uh, for the long term, so it is not a developer uh, in the traditional sense. Um, it owns in excess of 45,000 uh, units uh, globally. And you can just see on the screen here um, some examples of some of the other London developments, which are refurbishment of, of existing buildings. And you've got the existing, um, the before shots at the top, and then the refurbished um, properties, uh, photographs of the refurbished property underneath. So uh, Premier House, you can see Premier House marked in the centre of the uh, image there. It's a square site. Uh, you've got the high street, uh, there on its western side. Uh, on the northern side is Canning Road. Uh, eastern side is Gladstone Way and behind that obviously the Peel House car park, which is potentially uh, the site of the new Civic Centre. And you can see on the top right hand side of the image there, Harrow and Wheelstone Station. As a result of its location in Wheelstone Town Centre, it's obviously a highly accessible location. Uh, it has a PTAL of five. Um, the dotted line that you can see is a, a four minute walk time. So you can see it's uh, about four minutes from, from the station. The building itself um, is five storeys, ground and four upper floors. On the ground floor, there is a uh, mix of uh, community and commercial uses. There are two retail units, uh, as well as a library, cafe uh, and NHS offices. On the first floor, you have a private uh, use, which is permitted under sui generis permission, which is in use as a banqueting suite. And then on the upper floors is vacant floor space, the majority of which is um, former office space uh, with an element of uh, D1 uh, space. Some photographs now um, of Premier House uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it. Um, shot on the left hand side there is from the High Street and the image in the middle here is from the corner of um, Canning Road and Gladstone Way. So what I um, I do now is just mention about the planning history. The site um, has an extensive planning history. Um, Achilles themselves ach achieved a prior approval for 55 units in February of this year on the office floor space. Um, and then prior to that, the former owners of the site uh, had achieved uh, prior approval for 98 units on the office floor space. And as I said, the, the office floor space is not part of the current application. But in addition to that as well, there's been two permissions for an additional story on the building, one for 17 HMO units and one for nine residential units. And you can see the image uh, here uh, of the design of that scheme. So I've just proposed now to go through the proposals on a floor by floor basis. 
on the ground floor, the, the main uh, point in terms of the current application is the entrance here from Canning Road, which is um, will take you up to the residential floors, and I'll talk about this entrance in more detail later on. The ground floor is not actually part of the current application. It's shown here for illustrative purposes. Um, members might be aware that the majority of the ground floor floor space is actually leased to the council. I think your lease extends to 2033. And then in addition, there are two um, commercial shop units. Um, we've just shown how the ground floor potentially could be used uh, in a variety of other ways for community uh, or civic uses. And that's really just shown um, for the purposes of discussion. And Achilles is, is always happy to discuss with the council um, how the use of the ground floor um, could be could be used perhaps more efficiently. Uh, and there's some images here of just um, what that uh, ground floor might look like. In terms of the first floor, so the first floor comprises um, eight residential units, which are on the western side here fronting the high street. The purple area here is the uh, refuse area for the residential element and the dark blue is cycle storage, the majority of which is the cycle storage uh, for the residential uh, element. The refuse uh, area for the residential is in accordance with the council standards and equally the cycle parking throughout the site is in accordance with intent to publish London plan uh, standards. And then the area here is shown as workspace um, and this is envisaged as potentially uh, a cafe stroke workspace. That is open to any members uh, of the public. It's not uh, it's not proposed to be restricted to um, uh, residents of the building. Um, we see that potentially as a use, uh, obviously appropriate for its town centre location, but a use which would work should the new civic uh, centre move to the Peel House car park. Um, we see a lot of uh, synergy uh, in that. If I just go back to the layout plan, the entrance to the new commercial uh, floor space is here. This is um, Gladstone Way. Uh, on the eastern side of the building, so Peel House car park is, is here. The main entrance to the building, or uh, well, there's two entrances to the building. This entrance um, here uh, is a level access. Entrance to the commercial space here, and then there are four uh, disabled spaces here, uh, all of which will have EV um, pump charging. That is the only um, parking for the scheme. It's to be a car free uh, development um, achieved through uh, a legal agreement. On the second floor, uh, then the area in dark grey is the area which falls under the, is the former office floor space, which falls under the separate um, prior approval uh, application. Um, so Achilles have already achieved uh, a prior approval on uh, the site for 55 units. We are proposing to submit a further application uh, just to rework that to 73 units, um, which is obviously still considerably less than the 98 that's previously been achieved on the site and which remains uh, extant. Um, and this is our proposed uh, layout. But the three units here are, are the three which are um, part of the current application. There are still some minor discussions going on with officers just on a few points. One of the things we're looking at is the use of balcony screens here just to deal with issues of um, overlooking in terms of those two um, balconies. Um, on the third floor again, most of the third floor is uh, given over to the permitted PD scheme, but we have two uh, units uh, here which form part of the current application. And then on the fourth, uh, floor. Again, all of that forms part of the PE scheme. It, so then um, the majority of this application comprises floors five, six and seven. Uh, and it's the same layout on all three floors, uh, 10 uh, layout, uh, 10 units per floor, which comprises um, a mix of uh, unit sizes. And then what you have here is your lifts and here is the waste uh, cupboard and 
um, we're providing a chute system for uh, residents on upper floors um, whereby they can take their refuse to the waste storage cupboard and uh, utilise the chute system to place their uh, refuse in there and that prevents them having to take their refuse down through the lifts and, and out the building uh, that way and then obviously the the refuse generally is managed uh, on site by the uh, facilities management uh, team. In terms then of the overall um, accommodation mix, um, so the scheme altogether provides 43 uh, units and as you can see there's a, a mix of one bed uh, and two bed units predominantly with a, a lesser number of three bed units and both the one bed and two bed units are split between one bed, one persons, uh, one bed, two persons, and then two bed, three persons, and two bed, four persons. Um, there is um, affordable housing provided uh, on site. We are proposing 15% of the 43 units uh, to be affordable. Of, of that 15%, um, 70, obviously because this is a build to rent scheme, 70% um, will be at discount market rent, DMR. Um, which will be 80% uh, of market rent, whilst the remaining 30% will be at London uh, living rent. In terms of what the scheme will look like, um, there's a couple of proposed views now. So this is the corner, uh, the northeast corner from uh, Canning Road and Gladstone Way. That is the top view obviously is what it looks like at the moment and you can see there's this rather uh, imposing wall on the corner. Uh, apologies. Uh, and then uh, the lower, the, the, the picture at the bottom uh, is the proposed um, uh, entrance there. The next view is the view from the high street. So on the left hand side, that's the existing view. And then here you have the proposed uh, view uh, here of uh, what it looks like with the additional um, three stories um, being shown. You can see in terms of the materiality, um, you can see how it's going to match the existing building. Um, we are obviously looking at sort of reference but the, we're going to use uh, a mixture of brick slips to match the existing building which can be you know tinted um, so it matches uh, appropriately. Um, we have obviously looked very carefully at the entrances to the building. Um, clearly we need to make those entrances visible and legible. Um, there are two entrances. This is the entrance on Canning Road on the on the ground floor. Um, left hand picture is the entrance at the moment, the right hand is an image of uh, how we're seeking to improve that, particularly in terms of making it more visible from, from the high street itself um, and the bottom is a, a layout plan and you can see the concierge desk uh, there and so forth. And then the other entrance uh, is the one on the northeast corner and this is both an entrance uh, level access to the residential element um, with the service area here on the right hand side as well and then here you have the entrance to the commercial floor space. Um, and that that area there you know will be obviously appropriately landscaped we're looking at um, soft and hard landscaping treatments in terms of improving that area of the public realm uh, as much as uh, possible. And, and certainly you can see having removed that area of the existing brick wall, how it can be opened up and be made you know, much more uh, attractive than it is uh, at the moment. In terms of the height, so just to clarify, obviously the building is five stories at the moment, ground and four uppers, we are putting three additional stories on the building uh, to create an eight storey uh, building. In terms of just other uh, general planning matters, um, as I said on before, we've got four disabled parking spaces. That is the only parking on site. Um, all of the units will be, uh, both in terms of this application and indeed the PD scheme, will all be restricted through the legal agreement um, for a car free scheme. All of the parking spaces will be uh, have EV charging, so that's more than the London plan requires us to provide. Cycle parking is in accordance with the new higher intent to London plan standards um, to the acceptance of your highway officers. 
In terms of energy and sustainability, we are proposing a um, carbon free, uh, so net zero carbon scheme. Um, and in accordance with um, both the adopted and emerging London plan, we will achieve a minimum of 35% on site carbon uh, reduction. In terms of just the PD element, which as I say is not part of the current application, uh, as I say, the site has a history in terms of its office uh, element of PD approvals. Um, the first of 98, uh, the current one of uh, from Achilles of 55 and we're now proposing uh, to revisit that for uh, 73 unit scheme and this layout here is our proposed uh, PD layout but that is an application which has not yet been submitted to the council. Here we just have an example of some of the uh, units. Uh, Achilles as I say they manage over 45,000 uh, units globally, principally in metropolitan centres. Um, they are very experienced at providing high quality, um, smaller units pr uh, predominantly um, with a very high quality um, fit out. So just in summary then, before questions, um, in terms of the summary of the benefits, uh, as we see of this scheme, obviously the site has a history of residential permission, um, but this application seeks to provide residential development, obviously in an area earmarked for significant uh, growth and development. Obviously it's in the housing zone and the opportunity area. Um, it provides a better mix of dwellings, we think, than the previous uh, prior approvals on the site. Um, it provides obviously benefits, we think, to the general area provides workspace in an accessible um, location and it's a it's new investment it's, it's a vote of confidence in Wheelstone Town Centre and we see obviously um, that this would work very well with the development of the Peel House um, car park um, and furthermore it will also remove uh, what we consider to be a non-conforming use, which is the banqueting suite, which Achilles now own, um, in terms of the relationship of that with the existing residential uh, approvals on site. That, that I think is our brief presentation of the proposals. We have been working obviously with officers um, through a PPA uh, for a number of months and we're very grateful for the feedback that we've had from officers. Um, there are a few minor points that we're still just discussing, um, but we would uh, are looking forward to submitting this application um, in the summer of this, this year. If members have any questions now, um, Myself and uh, Ashua from Clara Collins, the architect, are available, and also Paul Grundy from uh, Achilles. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 got a bit of an echo somewhere. somewhere. Are there any, are questions? any questions? No, I don't see anything. Right. Stephen. Just, just, um, just a quick one. Um, I don't know why wasn't okay. um, You mentioned that um, the, the second, the, the, the first floor um, use is now inactive. Um, that, that's, that refers to the, the banqueting suite, I think. Have they now moved out? Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not inactive. The first, first um, Paul can confirm this, but the um, no, the banqueting suite is remains in operation. Uh, Achilles have purchased the banqueting suite, um, but it remains in operation. Okay, but, but obviously, as a result of this development, that would be that would be converted to the residential use. Uh, yes, as I say, the, the ownership of the banqueting suite is now with Achilles, so they are now renting the premises from Achilles. Um, in order for this scheme to come forward, the banqueting suite will uh, will be moving on. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other questions? No. Thank you very much for that, um, and we look forward to developments. Thank you for so, your time. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to item 11 on the agenda, which is a presentation on the Vaughan Road car park site? Mr Chairman, I'm just leaving the meeting now. Can someone invite me back when we're at the right 
when we finish this presentation. Thank you. OK. Uh, good evening, uh, 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 Chair and members. My name's John Bowles. I'm um, a director of Savills, and I'm just going to open this presentation. Um, my colleague, I have two colleagues who will be joining me in the presentation. I'm just waiting for my colleague to bring up our PowerPoint. Um, thank you first for allowing us to present to you. Um, we wish to present a proposal for a seven to 12 storey, um, 146 bedroom apart hotel and rooftop restaurant with roof terraces and a new public realm at the um, a Vaughan Road car park site, uh, which I know most of you will be familiar with. Um, before uh, describing um, the site context and then handing over to um, my colleague Adam Khan, Architects, to describe the proposals, um, I first would like to um, introduce um, Ali um, Reza Ravenshad, who is um, the um, proprietor and owner of Dandy Living. Um, to introduce who uh, Dandy Living as a as a brand and a company, uh, and also to explain their track record and experience. So, handing over to you, Ali. We can't hear you, Ali, if you're on mute. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. <laughs> We are, we, are, uh, we are a family office in a real estate uh, investment uh, company based in London since 1985. Uh, we've got over 20 freehold, um, freeholds requiring development with variants of importance in Harrow, um, one of which is uh, Vaughan Road. Um, in the past, we've tried to uh, work with Harrow Council to revamp the town centre uh, unfortunately, St George's fortune changed and they had to bail out. Um, well, we had made other um, attempts to assist uh, and work with uh, Harrow Council, such as selling back our 20 leases on a Peel, Peel House car park, which was, uh, I think, the previous application. Um, and uh, it is in our interest to um, try to bring Harrow Town Centre uh, and bring it on the, on the map and give it some presence currency. Uh, I was just trying to um, look at Google to see what comes out when you put Harrow on the hill. Unfortunately, it just shows five bars and then, and then Yelp says no, nothing. It says no information is available and we'd like to change that and, and, and uh, we'd, we'd like to change it in a mean, meaningful way. Um, in a more collective, um, collective way by introducing restaurants, bar, brasseries, boulangers um, within uh, the town, town centre vicinity, so people can stay at night and enjoy a, a nice evening out at an affordable price. We're uh, engaging with Mission Star chefs who could. Uh, bring the expertise and, and do a diner where you can spend as little as six, seven pounds a plate and have two or three. Uh, thank you for showing that. Yeah. Um, so you could spend in effect 20 pounds or 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 25 pounds to have a meal or, a, or a three dishes overlooking um, St Mary's uh, Church and, and Harrow Hill. Um, and also secure the uh, underground uh, underpass, which is not safe. I think you're all aware of the issues there and um, seize the opportunity to, to actually do more of that uh, elsewhere within uh, a mile and a half, two miles of this location. Um, and that said, that's me done. Great. Okay, Thanks, you've got the prices here. Yeah, you can go over that. Yeah, these are the prices, for instance, of of the the Michelin star that exists, the more diner. You can see you can have a uh, Michelin star food for seven pound fifty pence, eight pound fifty pence. You can have one, two, or three to suit your budget. Thank you for showing that. Over to you. Uh, so the site, um, as, as members and officers will be aware, is, is one which was formerly in council ownership. Um, it's a former car park 
um, and it serves and it served as a car park a town centre function. So it it functioned as as a a destination, if you like, for uh, visitors to the town centre. And so the proposed use that we're looking at, we believe, continues effectively that relationship to the town centre, and we're looking to enhance it. Uh, the site is um, situated in PTAL 6A. Uh, it's about 450 metres from the underground station and about 350 to 400 metres from the bus station. It's very much a gateway site to the town centre, uh, especially from the south um, on the, and the approach uh, on Bessborough Road. And we think it, um, uh, it also has this uh, significance because it fronts onto the roundabout, which is a major junction, as you'll know, in the town centre, um, linking Besborough Road or joining Besborough Road, Lowlands Road and uh, Greenhill Way. Um, it affords, therefore, a wonderful opportunity for a very high quality and high profile building. And that's very much the theme of how we're developing the proposals. Um, the environment of the car park and the pedestrian cycling underpasses and indeed the steps up over the railway are, um, are not ideal at the present time. They're not particularly welcoming um, and we think that there is an opportunity as part of the development to enhance the public realm. Uh, the site has an approval for, a, plan, uh, for um, a four to eight storey building for 33 residential units and uh, some commercial space. And as part of that, you'll see in these images, uh, uh, there was very much a theme of trying to enhance the public realm at the entrance into the underpasses and to, uh, towards the town centre. And that's a theme that we're uh, picking up and developing through our proposals. Um, I'm going to pass over now to Sonia Desor of Adam Khan Architects, who is going to um, talk you through the design development. Um, I would stress that this is a work in progress. We're some way away from a planning application submission, but uh, these these are how we are developing the proposals. Thank you, John. Can everyone hear me OK? I hope so. Um, so just as John has mentioned, the site offers a key opportunity to deliver a striking high quality building and public realm with a landmark presence to Harrow. Um, and what we are interested in doing is looking at the massing to really be driven by the brief, which is to deliver a minimum of 150 bedroom apart hotel, um, as well as a rooftop restaurant, as Dan, as Dandy has explained, and the aspiration to improve on that public realm um, to the ground, um, providing active frontage um, of commercial use, um, and um, and and also look at how the building steps in massing um, to mediate between the scale of the town centre buildings and the local residential context that you see here on the south. The impact on the streetscape really drives the way that the massing is moulded. Um, and um, looking at these axonometrics, so this is an axo looking at the corner of Besborough Road and Vaughan Road, and this is an axo looking at the corner of Vaughan Road. And you can really see that um, mediation between the buildings to the north of the site and to the south. And so the massing is stepped from the street to minimise impact on the neighbouring low rise residential buildings. And that's also a part of um, reducing overshadowing con constraints. Um, and what these steps do is create terraces that we would like to richly plant to offer greening to the massing. Um, the massing also uses a series of open courtyards um, that respond to specific urban conditions. Uh, for example, the central uh, courtyard here offers a moment in the public realm um, to address an entry and arrival point to the building. And the use of uh, the language of the curve um, is, is repeated throughout the massing adjustment um, to adjust to the site constraints, um, to soften the corners. So you can see that happening here and here. Um, and it also visually enhances the separation between the taller 12 storey massing to the seven storey massing. Um, by doing that, you'll see in the street views, it creates a very interesting articulation of the building roofline. 
So looking at Lowlands Road, which um, this view is really a key approach to the site from Harrow uh, Town Centre and, and the station. Our building, which sits at the corner and in in essentially a knuckle of a site, um, is a key focal point for the local context, a place of arrival and establishing a destination building. Um, and you can really see how the building sits um, in context of um, the buildings sitting on the other side of the railway where you've got the Morrisons. And um, just like that view from Lowlands Road, um, Greenhill Way, um, which is this road here, and this view looks south um, across the railway, which is passing across here, um, shows how the building creates a landmark corner approach um, and steps down in scale from the 12 to the, the seven storeys. Um, and how the, the stepped massing um, and the terraces that are created at that corner approach and um, the sides here, as well as that internal courtyard creates that separation between that taller and lower uh, massing. This is an elevation study that just shows how our building sits in comparison with some of the um, buildings in the local uh, context. And just looking at the ground floor plan, um, there's a real focus on our ground floor strategy to deliver high quality public realm, as John mentioned earlier, for not only the people arriving and going to the town centre, either via the underpass or the stairs leading to the bridge here to the north, um, um, as an arrival point to that central courtyard leading to the main entrance of the court uh, to, uh, to the hotel. But it also that that public realm is um, about creating a sense of place for the local neighbourhood. So um, by um, addressing this corner and planting trees and including rich planting to and robust materials to this public realm. We're really activating and creating attractive space. Um, and then by providing these active fronted um, commercial spaces, um, which are these areas in pink here, um, we're creating overlooking um, to create those safer um, spaces um, for the local uh, neighbourhood. Looking at a typical um, hotel uh, floor layout. Um, we have a central corridor that creates uh, roughly around 22 units, uh, 22 rooms, um, and there are a mixture of rooms types for double twin and family rooms. Some are connecting and some are also wheelchair accessible, um, but the, the, the premise is that each corner unit really maximizes on being slightly larger and um, taking advantage of those dual aspect opportunities. Looking at the upper floor plan, so this is the, seven, the eighth floor plan that shows access to a communal terrace um, that essentially um, overlooks um, the public realm here to the, um, the east. Um, a typical floor um, provides seven units um, and what this floor plan also shows is the steps in the massing that create these terraces that will be richly planted part of this greening strategy to soften the uh, appearance of the building. Looking at the um, restaurant floor um, we have uh, maximized the use so that it really benefits from um, orientating the restaurant so you're really taking advantage of those local and uh, long range views towards the city and um, Harrow Town Centre. We've started to develop a strong, uh, taking a strong inspiration from the local context inspired by the grand house qualities of the Harrow School buildings which you can see here um, and uh, looking at using rich materiality to create a character and interest. Um, we're interested in expressive detailing such as brick relief and terracotta accents, again taking reference from those, those um, historic buildings. 
And this is a study where we're exploring using the rhythm and proportion of the brick piers to create verticality and elegance. Um, so you can see here some of the piers are finer at the corners and slightly um, wider when you get um, to the central part of the elevation. And then the, what we'd like to do is establish a really strong base um, with expressive openings using these arched, a rhythm of arched openings that really help activate and engage with the public realm. This is a study that tests some of those ideas, um, very initial study, um, but what we what we use this for is really exploring the material colour texture of the type of brickwork, the tone of the base compared to the upper um, body of the building. And this is an initial street view looking at Lower Besborough Road looking north. Um, and what this really shows is the importance of um, high quality design um, to achieve a landmark building, which is what we're really focusing on. Um, so that is really um, driven in, in this uh, emerging uh, work in progress visual that starts to take reference to some of those ideas about um, addressing a really strong base um, and a rival point for the hotel, creating um, good tree planting in some of those corner courtyards, um, greening of the terraces, the rhythm of um, and verticality of the uh, brickwork as it goes up and the proportion of the windows, which is something we're, we're exploring at the moment. So what's on, sorry, so, so what Sonia's uh, run through basically is the, is the design evolution that we're working through and we have some way to go still on it, but um, we're working to uh, design up a very high quality apart hotel and rooftop restaurant, um, which we, we believe will widen the offer and attraction of uh, Harrowtown Centre. Um, we've undertaken a demand assessment for this type of hotel accommodation, um, which shows, uh, and that's been undertaken by my, my practice, Savills, which shows that there's a particular need and opportunity for this style and quality of apart hotel accommodation in the area. That's a trend which is going global, I have to say, and the UK is somewhat behind the trend at the moment in relation to that quality uh, and type of accommodation. Um, and the need for the additional hotel accommodation um, is recognised in the, um, the new intend to adopt London plan. Um, so our intention is to provide a striking high quality building. Um, we intend to incorporate urban greening significantly uh, through roof terraces and we also uh, and also through enhanced public realm. Um, we intend to provide active frontages. We think that that will be beneficial in security um, and accessibility terms and, and um, make the, the journey by foot and by cycle into the town centre from the west uh, and southwest, something which is much more attractive um, to local residents. Um, and we believe that this will encourage those, uh, an increase in those type of journeys. Um, uh, as I said, we believe that there's a uh, uh, that there is a um, particular demand for this type of apart hotel development, which isn't being provided elsewhere in Harrow Town Centre, um, and it's responding to a modern and fast evolving expectation in the hotel sector. Um, the rooftop restaurant and the function uh, and the and the function venue that will be provided with it um, will be of a quality which isn't currently available in Harrow. Um, we also believe that through relatively simple measures, um, both on the site and um, through the underpass system, um, we can develop um, uh, and deliver a significant improvement in public realm in, in, uh, in this particular location. Thank you very much. Um, we, 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 uh, we're open to questions um, and I have a couple of other colleagues who I haven't introduced yet who can assist if if there are particular technical questions that are raised. OK, thank you for that. Are there any questions? Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sharon. Um, in uh, thank you for the presentation um, in describing this as an apart hotel. Um, is the intention that, that people would use this as they would a hotel or um, which did you also have in mind that people would 
uh, potentially stay stay there for longer um, than they would um, in a normal hotel, potentially on a for an, for an indefinite period of time. It certainly wouldn't be an indefinite period of time, but what we want to do is cater for a range of, dif uh, of different lengths of stay. So the intention is, is that it would operate as a traditional hotel for, you know, short one, one night, two night stays. But there, there will be a proportion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, customers, visitors who would stay for longer periods. That might be a couple of weeks and it might extend up to a number of months, but it would be limited by condition. So one of the factors that we have yet to start the discussion with the planning officers about is effectively how we divide up, if you like, the the requirements in the condition of length of stay. So it so it would cater for a range of uh, demands. Um, and would they all be essentially operated as 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 one operation or would some of them be potentially sold off or uh, or, or let as, as like sort of holiday homes? They, it would be one operation. They would be uh, effectively paying um, for the accommodation on a room on a room per night um, or per week basis. Um, and they would be wholly reliant on the services and the facilities provided by the um, by the building, by the management of the building, the hotel operator. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Samfer, I can see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we lost a couple of hotels uh, during the last uh, few years in Harrow and uh, which really we need a good hotel in Harrow to bring some kind of uh, life to Harrow Centre. Uh, so so it's, it's a good development. I mean, uh, we need hotels and uh, uh, good restaurants in the area. Uh, well, my question is, uh, how many rooms uh, approximately you expect to be there? And uh, my other question is uh, parking. I mean, is this uh, going to be nice building? Is going to be parking facility uh, in the basement or uh, how are you going to deal with it? Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, I'm going to, um, I'll answer the first part of the question and then I'm going to tend to, uh, tend to have my colleague Chris Gent, um, who's our transport consultant, who can just uh, answer your question about car parking. Um, there, there, there will be 146 rooms in the hotel. Um, those will be a, a combination of um, double and twin rooms. A number of them will be interconnecting rooms so that they uh, and so they provide they will offer family accommodation as well for stays. They will have within them some basic services. So um, uh, a, a microwave and a, a fridge to allow people to uh, bring in, if you like, some of their own food. That is, I have to say, a modern expectation in hotels uh, these days is that people are more independent about how they uh, um, cater for themselves even in a in a hotel environment uh, and I and your point about um, losing hotels I, I think frankly that is indeed a um, an increasing trend is that old-fashioned hotels and the old style of hotel offer are very much um, uh, being um, being superseded by modern demands and so these hotel uh, rooms are designed to be ones which are bigger than usual, providing a range of more accommodation to allow people to work in them uh, and to spend more time in them so that they're not the type of sort of executive building, executive hotel um, type rooms where really you're only in there to sleep. Um, so that that is a lot of thought has gone into the design of the rooms themselves. Chris, can you jump in and just say something about the car parking and servicing? Sure. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Um, so the the car parking proposal is for the hotel itself to be car free, with the exception of two blue badge parking spaces, which are located to the rear of the hotel. Um, the hotel's website will make it very clear that there are only those two blue badge spaces on site that are available for guests to pre-book. In terms of other arrivals, um, the work that we've done so far, we expect 85 to 90 percent of uh, sort of primary arrival and departure trips to be by public transport, 
um, and then a small number on top of that by taxi and then as guests go in and out through the day guests may, may go out by taxi so the total trips throughout the day are about 15 percent by taxi the website will also uh, make clear that there is uh, other parking 24-hour parking available in the local area at Harrow on the Hill parking station at uh, Harrow on the Hill station car park and at St Anne's shopping centre um, so that those are the proposed solutions for car parking. It's not proposed that uh, car is a dominant mode for people to travel to this particular hotel. Thank you. Okay, thanks Thank you. for that. Stephen, have you still got your hand up or? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I did. So I, I was going to lower it, but actually I, I did want to ask a follow up to that. Um, you, you've, you've just mentioned that um, people who are driving uh, could be redirected to the Harold Hill Station car park, but uh, uh, I, I believe that that is going to be redeveloped as part of the Harold Hill Station um, development. So, um, is is that being um, is, is is that going to be revised in in your uh, in your in your in your understanding of the of the local area? So, uh, if the car park is still there and is still available, then it, it clearly it will be on the website. And if it's not, then it won't. Hopefully the uh, St Anne's car park will still be available 24 hours a day. Um, but it, as I say, we don't expect very many people to choose to drive to this hotel. It, it's not it's not what we're expecting in terms of the patronage. Sorry, I mean, if I may interject, there is also yeah. Queen's car park, uh, which is extremely underused uh, and, and even closer to, to, to the site, um, which was owned by me actually. I just, sold it so it um, it's that is literally uh, about 150 meters away i mean what, what, um in your in your experience of, of running apart hotels do, do you have a do you have a particular um is there is is, is 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 there a particular sort of profile of, of of the sort of uh how people tend to um tend, tend to uh uh travel to them um, do they do, do they do they sort of tend to travel there predominantly on public transport and taxi, or or do you get people? Do you still get people driving there? Sorry, was it addressed to me? Well, I was going to suggest Chris because we we yeah. based um, we, we based the demand assessment on um, uh, so so benchmarking against a whole range of different hotels. So mm. not only are we looking at apart hotels, but we can derive what we think is is the very much the likely demand based on assessments of lots of hotels. So Chris, do you just want to say something about that? Yeah, sure. I, I was just waiting to see whether uh, Ali had anything to, to say based on his experience as well, but uh, very happy to jump in. Um, typically, hotels that are well located close to public transport nodes, uh, as this one is, the primary way people want to travel to a hotel anywhere within Greater London is by public transport. The, the challenges of uh, driving through London streets, congestion charging, uh, ULEZ uh, zones, etc. Um, the cost of parking make it very unattractive for the majority of people to drive to a hotel within Greater London. So our experience is very much if you have a hotel and you provide free car parking, people will use it. Um, if you don't, then you don't attract those type of customers. But, but all, all the things you've described, those are features of sort of inner and central London. If you've got people coming from, uh, obviously we're on that we're right on the edge of Greater London. If you've got people coming from from elsewhere in the country that want want an apart hotel on the edge of London, um, you know, for for whatever it is they want to do, either business or pleasure, um, you know, they they may they may very well want to drive. And, and I also would have thought that the character of an apart hotel would um given given the given the nature of it and you know perhaps being a bit more self-catering and a bit more like an apartment um that would that would uh in addi additionally make make you know people typically more want to drive to it than if it was a, a regular hotel with, with regular hotel rooms I, I, ali will co correct me if i'm wrong but a, a, a typical uh person who, who would want to go for this style of hotel is perhaps a business person traveling from 
elsewhere in the country or overseas um, who, you know, the, the easiest way of them getting around London is, is via public transport. Um, and they want to stay in this type of hotel where there's a bit more independence. You do have the ability to cook for yourself if you choose to. Um, but it's, I don't think it's necessarily holidaying families that it's being aimed at. Um, I'm just wondering because uh, we've, we do have an unallocated uh, roughly about uh, 50 spaces uh, available uh, behind some of the buildings that we own um, there on College Road uh, that are empty all the time. You could just zoom in and you can see. I mean, we could always uh, organize something for the residents to use them if if need if needed. Uh, they're not used. They're always empty. Uh, sorry. I Pass over to Marilyn. Um, yeah. Somebody else got a question? I mean, what, what we have done in the past, particularly with the, the development on College Road, was. Um, yeah, I did have but, my hand up, when, but not too right. um, That we, we, people that moved in there, were able to rent car parking spaces in Queen's House. Uh, which is under use at the moment. So it's quite possible that the hotel operator may wish to do the same thing and say rent 20 spaces on a on a you know on a lease basis in Queen's House. Just a suggestion. Anyway, Marilyn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dandy Living for a really good presentation very interesting and uh, some of the questions that I might have wanted to ask have been very well answered so I'm very grateful to that uh, for that. Um, Chairman, I, I don't wish to be disrespectful to you in, in the slightest but um, I'm afraid, uh, uh, although it is a matter for you, um, I don't think uh, that uh, in some respects uh, you've quite got this right around your presence during this presentation, you see that the major uh, development panel purpose um, is to look in, at concepts and comment on presentations of future proposals. But it can't have escaped your notice because it is in your remit that we recently sold this site to this developer. And um, we've actually been very grateful, I think, for an excellent presentation tonight about his more recent acquisition. Um, but in the end, it is a matter for the local planning authority to determine this. And we note that you are never uh, present uh, because you have a, a declarable, uh, disclosable pecuniary interest in this particular developer. And that, again, I repeat, is a matter for you. Um, and it also can't have escaped anyone's notice that um, this came to cabinet um, uh, for um, decision to sell this site uh, last year in the summer and that report was, was withdrawn. It had your name on it and then it came back in September but you weren't at that meeting in spite of the fact that you did go to planning meetings before and after that um, and actually your name had been um, replaced by Councillor Schwersky for finance and hence in the leader which is a little strange. Um, I want to reassure you, Chairman, that I'm not accusing anyone of wrongdoing. I would never do that. Uh, but it is a little odd. Um, and quite frankly, um, you know, we, we, we do feel um, that, that you shouldn't really stay in the room for this. And we do think that, um, just like with Councillor Osborne, who lives nearby, uh, that you either have an association with Danda Living or you don't. Um, and frankly, um, it is pretty clear on the balance of probability, that is, that just possibly um, you always, and that is you as the portfolio holder with this remit, intended to sell these sites to this developer with whom you have a business relationship. And the test is what the man in the street thinks. And I know that my colleagues and I, excluding Councillor Osborne, with whom I've never discussed this because he has a disclosable interest and he's very honest about these things. Um, we think that you always intended to sell this site to these people. And I'm sure, and, and believe me, that I, they've done nothing wrong. I'm sure they're excellent people to deal with. 
and uh, please, please don't misunderstand me, but I'm not happy with what's happened here tonight, neither are my colleagues, and frankly, um, Chairman, I think that uh, there are questions that need to be asked about your conduct. Right, if I can respond to that, I didn't sell this site. I, um, I pointed out that uh, I had a disclosable pecuniary interest. The matter came to a cabinet meeting under the name of the leader. I did not attend that cabinet meeting and I did not vote in that cabinet meeting. And as for tonight, this is not a decision making body and therefore I didn't feel necessary to express an interest, but you may take it up in other channels if you wish to. Are there any other questions? Well, Chairman, no. I, I don't think that really covers it. Thank well, you. it's it's up to you to pursue it somewhere somewhere else. There are channels well, open to you. As long as the man in the street realises what's going on at this council, that's fine. Thank you. Um, we did have a, a suggestion that we would listen to Councillor Marikar. I don't think she joined the meeting. Um, I can't see her on the list of participants. So if there are no more questions, can we invite Councillor Osborne to rejoin the meeting? Is he back? Um, just for the uh, sake of clarity here, if I may add uh, that the property was um, handed over briefly to um, Allsop auctioneers who then contacted me to say that they're going to put it on the market for 2.5. Uh, it's important to note that we actually paid 600,000 over what it was valued just for the sake of clarity. Yes, I gather that you paid over the odds. Yes. Uh, but that wasn't the point I was making. Okay. <laughs> Is Councillor Osborne back yet? Yeah? yeah, I'm back. Good. OK, we move on to update on various topics. I don't know if um, if Beverly or Aurora have got any updates they wish to present. Chair, I have no updates uh, for the panel this evening. Thank you. OK, thank you. Item 13, future topics and presentations. Um, if any members have got any topics that they wish to have presented to the next meeting in November, could they let the um, Chief Planning Officer know? And uh, item 14, is any other urgent business? I haven't been notified of any, so uh, we move on to the date of the next meeting, which is the 3rd of November 2020. Thank you very much and also thank you very much to the people that have been operating this system because the technology has worked very well. We've been able to see all of the presentations and we've been able to hear all of the people. It's um, probably a lot more complicated than it is for a, a normal planning committee meeting. I would imagine that this is the most complicated teams meeting that uh, this council has held so far. So thank you very much to the people that are doing the IT and to the planning officers who have arranged for us to view these four applications. And um, good, with that, good night to you all. Thank you. Good night. Have a good evening. Good thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.